Ni hao, that's hello in Chinese. Welcome to Viking China. My name is David Anderson. I'm a professor of history emeritus at California State University, Monterey Bay, and have traveled extensively in China since 1977. I was teaching university courses on China even before that. I'm a Viking resident historian, and I'm excited about Vikings' new cruises to China. Today, I will be sharing with you some highlights of the later history of China, from emperors to entrepreneurs. Specifically, this talk will focus on the Ming Dynasty, the Qing Dynasty, the Chinese Republic, and the People's Republic of China. For the Ming, however, China had a recorded history of more than 2,000 years. There were 13 major dynasties, that is hereditary monarchies, and several regional kingdoms. On this timeline, you can see the more well-known dynasties, Qin, Han, Tang, Sung, Yuan, Ming, and Qing. Note that most of them rule China for about three centuries each, which reveals remarkable stability and opportunity for economic, political, and cultural development. The Qin Dynasty takes its name from Qin Shi Huangdi, China's first emperor. He defeated several rivals, established authoritarian centralized control, began construction of the Great Wall, and standardized a system of coinage. His tomb near Xi'an has become famous because of the archaeological discovery in the 1970s of 8,000 life-size terracotta warriors guarding the gate. The name China comes from the Qin, uh, Qin Emperor, Qin Dynasty. Even before the Qin, the area along the Yellow River was known as the Middle Kingdom, Zhongguo in Chinese. And that is China's own name for itself. The Middle Kingdom is a proud, self-confident, and self-sufficient term that conveys the idea of China as the center of the universe. Today's discussion of later Chinese history will begin with the Ming Dynasty, 1368 to 1644 illustrated here by an image of Admiral Chung He. The McCartney mission and Boxer Rebellion were part of the collision between China and the West during the Qing Dynasty, which replaced the Ming in 1644 and ended in 1912 as China's last dynasty. The years from 1916 to 1949 were a period of internal conflict, including warlordism, invasion by Japan, and civil war. In 1949, Mao Zedong declared the founding of the People's Republic of China, which struggled at first with economic development. An example uh, is the Great Leap Forward, and political change, example of the Cultural Revolution. After Mao's death in 1976, Deng Xiaoping emerged as China's paramount leader and began the economic miracle that has come to define today's China. The long list of pivotal inventions attributed to China over the centuries underscores China's perception of its self-sufficiency. It has everything it needs to survive, and if not, it will invent it. Evidence of paper making and of the first compasses has been have been found as far back as the Han Dynasty in the second century BC, and evidence of printing and gunpowder from the Tang Dynasty in the seventh and eighth century. A theme throughout China's history has been the ebb and flow between periods of independence from the outside world and interference from the outside world. In 1368, after almost a century of rule by Mongol emperors, that was the Yuan dynasty founded by Kublai Khan, control of the empire came back into the hands of the Han, the majority ethnic group in China. 
the new rulers named their dynasty Ming, meaning bright or brilliant. The dynasties of China traditionally were great land empires, and the Ming was no exception. For a period in the early 15th century, however, the Ming launched seven naval expeditions that ventured as far west as the Arabian Peninsula and East Africa. In earlier dynasties, Chinese merchants had traded in porcelains and silks with Japan and Southeast Asia. But the Ming voyages were much larger scale. Under the guidance of an incredible mariner and organizer, Chung He, China built a fleet of more than 300 ships, much larger than, for example, the Spanish Armada. 62 were treasure ships measuring 400 feet long. Note the inset in the slide that compares the size of these giant seagoing junks to that of Christopher Columbus's flagship. It was an incredible feat of shipbuilding, but the voyages were primarily for exploration and diplomacy rather than commerce. After Chung He's death, the Ming did not continue exploring ocean routes, as did the nations like Spain and Portugal. The reasons are a combination of the massive expense, the self-sufficiency of China's own domestic economy, and a traditional prejudice against commerce as a less honorable profession than either a scholar who cultivates the mind or a farmer who cultivates the land. The architectural and infrastructure achievements of the Ming are among its most lasting impacts on China. The rulers moved their capital to Beijing, meaning northern capital, to distinguish it from the former capital Nanjing, meaning southern capital. They constructed the incredibly beautiful imperial palace in Beijing, known as the Forbidden City, because only the emperor and his court and retainers could enter, no one else. The basic arrangement of the palace was an enclosed complex protected by high walls and inside a series of nested boxes with enclosed courtyards leading from one temple or living quarters to another. The city itself was similarly enclosed by walls and by 1553, an outer city had been added making Beijing some four by four and a half miles in size. Note the plan in the Ming era painting in the center of the slide. It conveys the concept of the emperor as the center of the universe. The temple of heaven in the lower right is where the emperor entered once a year to reaffirm himself and China as the link between heaven above, the blue roof tiles, and the earth below, the brown walls. In the upper right is a portion of the Great Wall of China, built in segments over the centuries and repaired and completed by the Ming. Its total length is more than 13,000 miles, 20,000 kilometers, from the Yellow Sea to Western Mongolia, and was a fortification to protect the Middle Kingdom from invasion from the north. Now, over the span of traditional China, civil officials, or Mandarin, were recruited through a competitive civil service examination system. It began as early as the Han Dynasty, the second century AD, and was a regular practice by the Tang Dynasty in the seventh century. By the Ming and Qing, the examination system was basically the only way to achieve gentry or Mandarin status, and thus to become a government official. Candidates underwent years of study of classic literature. They memorized the Confucian classics and practiced calligraphy and the writing of poems and essays. There were many levels of exams from local up to national, and only one to 2% of candidates were successful at each level. 
as you can see in this slide, the type of hat and the embroidered Mandarin squares on the gowns indicate the degree the scholar had achieved. The advantages of the system were the recruiting of men of talent, note, all were men, and the continuity of cultural values and forms over time. The disadvantages were the narrowness of the training without practical subjects, and the length of time required, it could take years, which meant that only the wealthy could afford to study and to become officials. Before the Ming, China had Western visitors, notably the Venetian Marco Polo in the 13th century. But in the 16th century, Catholic missionaries made their appearance. One of the founders of the Jesuits, St. Francis Xavier traveled to Japan and Indonesia in 1552, but he never reached China. His disciple, Father Matteo Ricci, arrived in China in the 1580s and lived in Beijing for 10 years. He learned to read and speak Chinese and was an accomplished mathematician and astronomer. Following him was another Jesuit missionary astronomer, Adam Shaw von Bell, whom the emperor recognized as a gentry scholar, note he's wearing a scholar's gown, and made him director of the Imperial Observatory. The respect they gained as learned men enabled these Jesuits to build some churches, conduct baptisms, but their proselytizing gained only a small number of converts, as did the preaching of Franciscans and Dominicans who followed. Monotheism as a concept proved difficult to translate into a land with many deities. Similarly, wealthy gentlemen rejected the priest's teachings of monogamy as exhibiting callous disregard for the welfare of their concubines and their concubines' children. Early in the 17th century, Manchu military units, termed banners, attacked from the northeast and drove the Ming forces out of Beijing. The Great Wall of China did not always work, I guess. The Manchu leaders proclaimed the Qing or Pure Dynasty in 1644. It would prove to be China's last dynasty. Following the Republican Revolution in 1911, the last emperor abdicated the throne in 1912. The Qing Dynasty encompassed the largest land area in Chinese history. At its peak of power in the 18th century, it was the most prosperous empire in the world and saw prolific cultural and artistic achievements. The image in this slide is a Qing masterpiece that exemplifies in one work the three noble art forms, delicate painting, beautiful poetry, and skillful calligraphy. The three perfections is the term for the gathering of painting, poetry, and calligraphy to create a single artwork. Here, the artist infers the emotional experience and subtle nuance of witnessing a wet landscape following an evening shower. Following closely on the heels of Western missionaries traveling to China came Western merchants traveling to China, looking for products to export from Asia. Over the course of the late 17th and early 18th centuries, a large demand for Chinese tea, silk, and porcelain developed in Europe and in the British colonies in North America. In particular, the British demand for tea seemed so insatiable that some Chinese believed it must be a medicine that English needed in order to live. English imports of tea rose from 400,000 pounds in 1720 to 223 million pounds in 1800. 
China was able to make enough silk and porcelain and to grow enough tea leaves to supply the need. But the Western traders had to turn increasingly to sending large amounts of silver to pay for the goods. The silver sisi was a boat-shaped ingot of pure metal that had been used for centuries in China and became the medium of exchange for this trade. Colored papers cut in the shape of Sisi are still seen as symbols of prosperity in celebrations of the Lunar New Year and in ceremonies to pay honor to ancestors. The image in the upper left-hand corner of the slide is a painting of the warehouses known as factories in the port of Guangzhou, which was then called Canton in the south where Qing officials sought to limit direct Western access to China and the Chinese. The factory system that confined foreign merchants to Guangzhou far from the capital represented Beijing's traditional practice of treating trade as tribute to the emperor. That is that foreigners engaged in China only with permission and on terms dictated by the imperial government. Having just lost his own trade monopoly in North America as a result of the American Revolution, King George III of Britain sent Lord George McCartney to China to seek the Qing Emperor's permission to allow more items for sale in China. The cartoon in the lower right panel was a contemporary English satirist rendition of the meeting with Emperor Qin Long, who was very powerful and ruled for 60 years. The proud emperor believed the envoy's courtesy diplomatic gifts, which included clocks and telescopes to represent English technology, were tribute payments acknowledging China's superiority the emperor was offended by McCartney's refusal to perform the traditional Chinese bow or koto of submission and rejected McCartney's petition. The gulf of diplomatic and cultural misunderstanding between the two monarchies and their competing economic interest would soon lead to violent conflict. Unable come up with enough silver, silver bullion, to pay the Chinese for tea, porcelain, and other items in demand in England, the British East India Company came up with a plan to balance the trade deficit through the sale in China of opium sourced from India. In 1839, opium sales had more than balanced the tea, the tea purchases and silver began to flow out of China. Beijing was well aware of the addictive and debilitating effects of the drug and had regulated its sale in the past. Concerned about the silver drain and the social impact caused by opium, the emperor sent Commissioner Lin Zixu to Guangzhou. Commissioner Lin wrote a letter to Queen Victoria declaring, I have heard that the smoking of opium is very strictly forbidden by your country because the harm caused by opium is clearly understood. Since it is not permitted to do harm to your own country, then even less should you let it be passed on to the harm of other countries. There is no evidence Queen Victoria received the letter or answered it. Commissioner Lin then destroyed almost three million pounds of opium and confined the Western merchants to their factories. London considered Beijing's actions to be unacceptable. With its powerful cannons, the Royal Navy destroyed much of China's fleet of wooden junks, what became known as gunboat diplomacy, and landed troops that seized cities. The Treaty of Nan Nanking, today's Nanjing, ended the hostilities and required China to grant Britain possession of Hong Kong Island, 
open five treaty ports, the foreign residence and trade, pay an indemnity and guarantee extraterritoriality or legal protection for foreigners in China. Those were really harsh terms. Other unequal treaties, as they became known, followed a second opium war in 1856 to 1860, forcing more territorial and economic concessions from the Qing dynasty. Now, one of the palaces severely damaged and looted by foreign invaders in the Second Opium War was the magnificent Summer Palace, located a short distance north of the Forbidden City. If you visit Beijing, you can tour these marvelous sites. The Qianlong Emperor, at the height of China's wealth in the 1760s, had constructed this incredible complex of hills, lakes, gardens, and pavilions in honor of his mother's 60th birthday and as a water management system for the capital city. It was not a residence, but a short-term imperial retreat from the palace in Beijing. Inspiration for its design came from the famous West Lake at Hangzhou and other well-known places throughout China. The centerpiece of the Summer Palace was, <clears throat> and still is, the great temple of gratitude and longevity. There's also a long corridor that is elaborately decorated throughout. It's more than 700 meters of length. The marble boat, shown in the lower center of the slide, is a lakeside pavilion on the grounds of the Summer Palace. Destroyed by Anglo-French forces in 1860, the marble boat and other palace structures were restored by the Empress Dowager Zixi in 1893. Now, this brings us to one of the most intriguing women in Chinese history. The Empress Dowager Zixi was the dominant figure in the declining decades of the Qing dynasty and a symbol of the kind of waste and extravagance that historically occurred in the waning days of a dynasty. She was beautiful, vain, and self-indulgent. She loved to have her photograph taken. And as can be seen in this photo, she surrounded herself in luxury, including, as you see, the large bowls of fresh fruit because she loved the sweet fragrance. It is charged that she had money badly needed for rebuilding China's Navy put into the restoration of the marble boat, which she loved to sit in and pretend to be sailing. She was also ambitious, shrewd, and ruthless. She entered the imperial court as a concubine and was the mother of the only son of the Xin Feng Emperor. As a woman, she never sat on the dragon throne, but was often the literal power behind the throne, exercising her influence first through her young son, the Tongzhi Emperor, and then her nephew, the Guangxu Emperor. She was not a total reactionary and accepted some technological and even political change in China. When she believed radical political reformers exercised too much influence on her nephew, the Guangxu Emperor, however, she had him placed under house arrest in 1898 and may have had him poisoned shortly before her own death in 1908. Reportedly, she sent him a gift of poisoned rice cakes. Shortly after Cixi had the reform-minded emperor arrested, she actually declared war on the Western nation by giving official sanction to the murderous rampaging of a secret organization called the Society of the Righteous and Harmonious Fists. Westerners called them boxers because their martial arts practices resembled shadow boxing. Impoverished farmers in remote areas of North China blamed the presence of Japanese and Western businesses as the source of their plight. And some historians have described the boxers as forerunners 
of the peasant nationalism in China's 20th century revolutions. Viewing foreign missionaries and churches as symbols of Western intrusion, the Boxers began murdering foreigners and Chinese Christian and destroying foreign property around Beijing. Joined by soldiers of the Imperial Army, they encircled the legations housing Western and Japanese diplomats in Beijing. There were hundreds of fatalities, Chinese and Western, in the fighting during July and August 1900, before a large military force representing eight nations entered the capital city and ended the Boxer Rebellion. As had happened after previous wars, the victors imposed harsh terms on the imperial government, including severe punishment of the rebellion's leaders, permission to state foreign troops, station foreign troops in China uh, to protect foreign, and payment of an indemnity of $330 million to the foreign nations involved. That was a huge sum of money in 1900. In one of her last acts before her death in 1908, she named her nephew's son the 12th Qing Emperor. Hui was not yet three years old in 1908, and he reigned only until 1912, when anti-monarchical revolutionaries forced his abdication. His personal story became familiar to the world with the release of the Hollywood film, The Last Emperor in 1986. After Japanese forces occupied Manchuria and created the puppet state they called Manchukuo in 1932, the Japanese authorities declared Kui to be the Kongda emperor of Manchukuo. His quote, rule ended with Japan's defeat in 1945. And in 1949, the newly declared People's Republic of China imprisoned him as a war criminal. Released after 10 years, he worked in Beijing as a civil gardener. Before his death in 1967, he bought a ticket as a tourist and visited the throne rooms in the Forbidden City, where the great and feared Qing emperors once ruled a vast and powerful empire. Although the Qing had made some small reforms, such as ending the ancient examination system in 1905, it was overwhelmed by forces of modernization. Led by Sun Yat-sen, a revolutionary movement had arisen determined to drive out the Manchu monarchs, establish a republican form of government, carry out land reform, and recover sovereign rights taken away by foreigners. On October 10th, 1911, a military uprising in what is today Wuhan triggered a sequence of events that led to the collapse of the imperial dynasty. October 10, double 10, 10, 10 is the national day of the Republic of China. Sun Yat-sen was the founder of the Guomindang or Nationalist Party of China and served briefly as provisional president of the Republic of China in 1912 after Pui's abdication. General Yuan Shikai commanded the regional army that controlled the Beijing area and that provided the military muscle for the new government. Yuan Shikai quickly succeeded Sun as provisional president of the Republic and in 1915 proclaimed himself the new emperor over Sun's opposition. Yuan died suddenly in 1916, and the nation devolved into more than a decade of power struggles between competing generals who ruled vast areas of China as warlords and fought against each other with armies numbering in the millions. On this slide, the map gives an indication of how fragmented China became. The chronology on this slide also shows that for four decades, China was racked by internal conflict and external invasion. 
In the 1920s and 1930s, under Sun Yat-sen and after his death in 1925, his leading military commander, Chiang Kai-shek, the nationalists struggled against the warlords and a rival revolutionary party, the Chinese Communists. As these two parties contested to achieve their own vision of a united China, Japan took advantage of China's weakness and internal division to seize Chinese territory. The result was the Second Sino-Japanese War from 1937 to 1945. By the way, in the First Sino-Japanese War in 1894-1895, Tokyo's forces had previously invaded North China, seeking territory from the impotent Qing government. But at that time, Western governments had pressured Japan to reduce its demands. Now, Japan was trying again. The nationalists and communists suspended their civil war until the Japanese were defeated. The civil war then resumed and ended in 1949 with the communists taking control of China's mainland and the nationalists removing their forces to Taiwan, which remains under the control of the Republic of China. The two great antagonists of the Chinese civil war were Mao Zedong and Chiang Kai-shek. They were exact contemporaries, although these photographs show a young Mao from 1938 and a mature Zhang from at least 20 years later. Zhang Kai-shek was a tough soldier and extremely loyal to Sun Yat-sen. His close ties to Sun and his political acumen positioned him to emerge as Sun's successor. Zhang Kai-shek led the Nationalist Army in a successful campaign against the warlords. It was called the Northern Expedition from 1926 to 1928. And he established the capital of the Chinese Republic in Nanjing in 1928, marking the beginning of what is known as the Nanjing Decade. Mao Zedong was, as a young man, at the first meeting of the Chinese Communist Party in Shanghai in 1921. The new party worked within the more established Nationalist or Kuomintang Party in the 1920s. And Mao held various Kuomintang positions, including head of its Peasant Training Institute in Guangzhou in 1926. Unlike other communist theorists, he came to believe that the peasants, not the urban workers, were the true revolutionary force in China. In 1927, the always tentative alliance between the communist and nationalist ended when Zhang launched the so-called White Terror in Nanjing to liquidate the communists within the Nationalist Party. Mao and other communists fled to southeastern China, where they established so-called Soviets, and the Chinese Civil War was on. Between 1930 and 1934, Chiang Kai-shek launched a series of five military encirclement campaigns against the Chinese communists in an attempt to annihilate their base area in southeastern China. The campaign successfully fought off the communists. Uh, the communists successfully fought off the first four campaigns marked with black X's on the map. But in the fifth campaign, Zhang mustered about 700,000 troops that completely surrounded the communist position. In October 1934, a communist force numbering 65,000 escaped the encirclement and began moving through rugged, rugged mountain terrain and crossed 24 rivers in western China. In what is now known as the Long March, the dashed red line on the map, this historic trek covered 6,000 miles. 10,000 kilometers, and ended a year later, 190 miles, 300 kilometers, north of the city of Xi'an at Yan'an. Other elements of what was called the Red Army followed, and Yan'an and its spacious cave dwellings became the communist revolutionary base for the next decade. 
During the long march, Mao emerged as the undisputed leader of the Chinese Communist Party. The heroism attributed to the Long March inspired many young Chinese to join the Chinese Communist Party during the late 1930s and early 1940s. In a dramatic incident in December 1936, a powerful warlord kidnapped Chiang Kai-shek in Xi'an and insisted that the nationalist end pursuit of the communist and concentrate instead on fighting the Japanese, who already occupied Manchuria. The nationalists and communists agreed to form a united front against the Japanese. The next year, Japan invaded and occupied much of eastern China around Shanghai and Nanjing. And Jiang moved the nationalist government inland to Chongqing, that was what called Chongqing. With the nationalist in Chongqing and the communist in Yan'an, the United Front fought against Japan with US and British assistance following the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor in 1941. Following Japan's surrender to Allied forces in 1945, the United Front ended in 1946 and violent civil war resumed in China. The Communist People's Liberation Army defeated the nationalist forces in 1949, and Chiang Kai-shek withdrew to Taiwan and continued the Republic of China there. The People's Republic of China, or PRC, has now governed mainland China for the past 75 years. On October 1st, 1949, Chinese Communist Party Chairman Mao Zedong stood on the balcony of the gate of the Forbidden City overlooking Tiananmen Square and announced the founding of the People's Republic of China. October 1st, 2024 marks the 75th anniversary of that momentous occasion. At that moment in 1949, some sporadic fighting continued in the South and the nationalist forces were redeploying to Taiwan. The roads, railroads, banking system, internal commerce were in shambles from years of war and civil war. The new communist government laid out plans to begin domestic reconstruction and to launch a military landing in Taiwan to complete the unfinished business there. Then, in June 1950, an internal war began in Korea between the Democratic People's Republic of Korea in the North and the Republic of Korea in the South. Beijing moved its forces, which had been massing in South China, up to the Korean border. And eventually more than 2 million People's Liberation, PLA, soldiers went to Korea. That was two thirds of the PRC's existing forces. The military developments and associated expenditures suspended the internal projects. When on behalf of the United Nations, the United States sent troops to Korea, Washington also declared support for the nationalist Chinese regime in Taiwan. Although China received financial and technical assistance from the Soviet Union to aid domestic reconstruction, the economy and daily life were slow to improve in the early days of the PRC. This idealized painting of Mao proclaiming the beginning of the PRC, surrounded by carefully placed likenesses of Chinese Communist Party leaders, that's Zhou Enlai on the far left and Madam Sun Yat-sen in the center, is an example of official efforts to convince the people that all was well. Through electronic and print media, plays and music, posters, school curricula, and work unit study sessions, Mao conveyed the party message. With revolutionary enthusiasm, Mao and the party were eager to rapidly advance China from a poor nation to a modern industrial state. At first, adopting a Soviet-style five-year plan, 
they built some roads, bridges, canals, and power plants, and collectivized agriculture. But China's per capita income remained one of the lowest in the world. With faith in the will of the Chinese people, Mao launched a second five-year plan, the Great Leap Forward in 1958. He ignored the need for engineering and technical knowledge with disastrous results. Many farmers were called upon to create a backyard furnace, like the one shown here. Mao asked the peasants to melt down their pots and pans and anything metal and small furnishes to manufacture so-called steel. Unfortunately, the resulting alloy was of such low quality that it was largely useless. In addition, disruption to farming occurred as farmers either did not plant the field or left the ones already planted to rot with no one available to harvest them. Widespread famine resulted in an estimated 20 to 30 million deaths. In the wake of the economic and human disaster, there was much recrimination and finger pointing within the party, including criticism of Mao. In 1966, the chairman took the initiative again and began what became known as the Great Proletarian Cultural Revolution. Mao was concerned that capitalist and Western ideas were growing within China, that Soviet models had become elitist, and that the spirit of the revolution, including his own personal legacy, was being lost. In June 1966, he ordered all schools from middle schools to universities closed and sent the young people throughout the country as red guards to root out bourgeois conservatism. The red guards accused some of their teachers, their neighbors, and even at times their parents and grandparents of being bad influences. Numbers are difficult to know, but many of those targeted were harassed, humiliated, sent to rural areas to do demeaning tasks, and assigned hard labor. Some estimates are that 3 million died and 100 million suffered in some form. A Mao cult emerged and produced serious strains within the party's top leadership. Even Mao grew concerned about the excesses. And with his approval, Premier Zhou Enlai gradually began moving the country back to normality. Mao suffered a serious stroke in 1972, and he and Zhou Enlai began to groom Deng Xiaoping as a successor as they worked to balance ideology and pragmatism in the PRC. One of the most recognizable symbols of the Cultural Revolution was the Little Red Book. Its actual title was Quotation from Chairman Mao Zedong. It contains 267 aphorisms from the chairman, covering subjects such as class struggle, correcting mistaken ideas, and the mass line, key tenet of Mao Zedong thought. It includes Mao's famous remark, political power grows out of the barrel of a gun. Mao himself reportedly liked its resemblance to books of quotation by philosophers such as Confucius. The book was a key feature of the personality cult, and the Red Guards and PLA soldiers would hold it high during rallies and chant, Mao Zhu Xi, Wan Sui, long live Chairman Mao. Now, what does ping pong or table tennis have to do with high level diplomacy? China has long been recognized as having a dominant team in international table, te table tennis competition. In 1971, an American and a Chinese player had a conversation at the World Championships in Nagoya, Japan. 
the governments of both countries were ready to make cautious direct contacts. The United States and the PRC had never established official relations, but officials on both sides quickly arranged for the U.S. ping pong team to visit China. China was seeking the benefit of trade with the world's richest nation and to broaden its international recognition beyond the so-called communist bloc. The U.S. President Richard Nixon sought diplomatic dialogue in pursuit of negotiations to end the American war in Vietnam and to decrease global tensions generally with the communist nations. Consequently, Nixon himself traveled to Beijing in February 1972 and met face to face with Mao Zedong and Zhou Enlai in a visit dramatically televised worldwide. The Maoist era ended with the chairman's death in 1976, and Deng Xiaoping soon emerged as China's paramount leader. Deng Xiaoping was a veteran of the Long March and had been in the upper echelons of the party for decades. Closely associated with Premier Zhou Enlai, Deng Xiaoping was a pragmatist and internationalist. He actively pursued the opening with the United States, and the two nations finally established normal, rela normal relations in 1979. Deng Xiaoping became the first leader of the PRC to visit the United States. He also moved to mute ideology and to encourage free enterprise to get China's economy moving. He is remembered today for saying, it doesn't matter if the cat is black or white, as long as it catches mice. State-owned industries and other Maoist institutions remained, but he encouraged entrepreneurship and declared that to get rich is glorious. He created special economic zones, such as the old treaty port of Xiamen and the sleepy border village of Shenzhen, which is now the bustling commercial gateway between Hong Kong and South China. Two highly competent, technocratic, and politically savvy presidents followed Deng Xiaoping, Jiang Zemin and Hu Jintao. Together, those two men continued and enlarged upon the economic reforms already underway. Two highly visible remnants of the unequal treaties forced on the Qing Dynasty were the British colony of Hong Kong and the Portuguese colony of Macau across the Lantau Channel from Hong Kong. Britain had a perpetual lease for Hong Kong Island but its 99-year lease for the new territories on Kowloon Peninsula was due to expire in 1997. Determining that colonialism was outmoded, London agreed to return the entire colony to China. In an elaborate ceremony on June 30, 1997, Prince Charles, now King Charles, and President Jiang Zemin confirmed the transfer, flanked by Premier Hu Jintao and Prime Minister Tony Blair, note in the, shown in the lower left corner photo on this slide. Hong Kong became a special administrative region, and in 1999, Portugal similarly transferred the sovereignty of Macau to the PRC. In 2001, the People's Republic of China achieved another landmark when it gained admission to the World Trade Organization. And in 2016, it hosted the meeting of the G20, composed of the nations with the largest economies in the world. As can be seen today in the magnificent of the restored Imperial Palace in Beijing and the nearby Summer Palace, Traditional China was at the height of wealth and success during the Ming and Qing dynasties. Through the gentry bureaucracy, the emperors ruled a vast territory and population. 
in the century, last century of the Qing era, however, Western ideas and military strength began to undermine the old order. The dramatic turning point, of course, was the turmoil begun in the Opium Wars in the mid 19th century. For the next century, from the 1840s to the 1940s, the Middle Kingdom experienced waves of challenges. The Revolution of 1911 ended the centuries old dynastic system, but was followed during the first half of the 20th century by clashes of huge warlord <coughs> armies invasion and occupation of Japan, and an intense political rivalry and ultimately violent civil war between the nationalists and communists. After 1949, the People's Republic of China began rebuilding the nation. Mao Zedong was the dominant figure who had prevailed in the internal political struggle, but economic and social progress was halting, as seen in the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution. After Mao, China finally gained the stability and international standing necessary to realize what is often labeled the Chinese miracle. Over the last century, Beijing has managed to statistically eliminate poverty in the country, produce more manufactured goods than any other nation, build gleaming cities, and play a central role in global politics. Elected President of the People's Republic of China in 2012, Xi Jinping is now seeking to realize what he calls the Chinese dream. In his words, realizing the great renewal of the Chinese nation is the greatest dream for the Chinese nation in modern history. Cheshengi, Zaijian, thank you and goodbye. And I hope to see you in China.